few stages. The first stage was, of course, uh, it was about saving lives. Uh, so it was only a preparation stage for us until we go there at the end of March. Uh, on March 23, 25, we did our first field work. Until then, we did preparation work. And then uh, we did the first and second field areas. We, I call this the first phase, the first stage. And uh, then we had a second field visit in June and the following uh, was in September. So the time period between the two, we call the second phase. We are going to have another in the middle of December. So I call this one the third phase. And all of these will go to the fourth stage, which will conclude the process. Within this process, a lot of things took place that we did. Also a lot of developments in the country which affected this area as well. I will try to talk about those during Zoom call, uh, the Zoom call. Uh, the goal of this work was, of course, at the beginning was to uh, assess damage in a quick way. As a result of the earthquake, Antakya, it has a rich cultural heritage. Uh, the third degree archaeological site we focused on so that the multi-layered cultural heritage in this area, how it looks after the earthquake, we wanted to assess the situation. And as a result of this assessment, uh, pro preserving and managing these areas after the earthquake and creating documents which could guide and uh, follow different phases of it. Look at the physical, sociocultural values and social significance of these areas, assessing them together and coming up with priorities, architectural, economic, social, uh, communal development plans was the goal and understand the dimensions of the damage and in the upcoming uh, repair uh, process uh, to uh, point out what should be taken into consideration, which means coming up with the parameters. So this was the goal of our study. Uh, the first stage, as I said, uh, from when we started working to the first uh, field visit, some things took place. For instance, a state of emergency was declared and there was a presidential decree, decree declared, which affected certain city centers and outside city centers as well. Uh, there were naturalizations, urgent ones, uh, ought to uh, Middle East Technical University Architectural Faculty uh, came together and uh, declared, uh, pub, uh, publicized an opinion. We came together as a big team. As I said, our volunteer team was a team uh, like this. Uh, the MA professors and students uh, civil engineering department, geological engineering, urban planning department. Also, uh, one professor from Hatay and uh, one doctor from Iskenderun Technical University joined our team. The impact of the earthquake should be assessed correctly and decisions of the future should be taken right. So we must know and be able to compare the situation. For that reason, we classified the studies that we did, not only ones that we did, but also some previous ones, official documents, uh, resolutions of the board, etc. We brought them together and, and we started creating a memory for Antakya, spatial memory. The, we had some old documents as well as looking at the different resources to gather information after the earthquake and manage to manage this uh, data well so that it can help uh, decisions. We cre started creating a, a system that we call CBC, Geographical Information System, uh, so that we can use in the uh, next decision-making uh, process. We uh, decided how to bring together information uh, and we created a system. One part of the system is this map that you see right now. Data comes from different resources. So some are data, not data that we collected personally. So in the CBC as a guiding document, then 
it could also be used by the ministry and the ministry could add more information to it. That's how we started preparing it. Which data comes from which resource? We uh, try to point it out so that it could guide. The Antakya, a third degree archaeological site, a urban site, open areas, we uh, gathered information as much as possible and entered it into the system. In the system, we focused on one thing more, uh, Zeminler and Gazi Pasha neighborhoods that you see in black here, Zenginler and Gazi Pasha neighborhoods. Uh, before the earthquake, we were working on these neighborhoods, so we had more information about the neighborhood here. We had a previous CBS on it as well, so we had more detailed information about this area. After creating the system, we started preparing for the field trip. We have a lot of disasters in the world, and we learn from every disaster. Everybody uses different methods to document and gather data. And we try to learn uh, so that we could use uh, it in the system uh, after our field trip. These are some of the titles and uh, the most practical methods. Uh, this is a data gathering system. Our first field uh, study in March 23. So. After we went to that uh, comes the second stage. I should also point out that during this process, all the participants were volunteers, but we were also supported by volunteer institutions, Middle East Technical University, as well as the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, also, the Association of Turkish Architects gave us great support in going to the area. Uh, the field work, of course, showed us a lot of damage. It would not be easy to gather data. The shakes, the quake still continued and damage was great. Our first goal was to gather information about every layer. As you know, Antakya has different time periods in its cultural heritage to see how much each was affected as much as possible. Not only the structures, but open spaces. They are a whole with the structures and with the team, especially understanding the relation that it has with people. In the field work, as we can see in the photos, the area was in a damaged, quite damaged situation. There were no people left. It was dehumanized, no humans. Uh, so there were also areas that we could not access. I mean, we were able to go in in one way or another, uh, but it was very difficult to gather, uh, as you can see here. We gathered data, uh, but the goal was not only to gather data in Antakya, there is a very intense uh, structured and uh, qualified uh, one, so we could not gather all data. So our uh, goal was to uh, create a method for the future study, uh, how to collect data, what to look at, which titles, how to classify, so that it could help for the future. In this data collection process, we had to use different methods together. Sometimes we used our smartphones. Sometimes we didn't have coverage, so we took physical notes in a very quick way. Sometimes using a sound recording, we had to gather data. Sometimes it was not even possible to stand straight to note down or gather data. We took photos and we tried to do in ma in many different places as possible. We tried to take photos because it was so much damaged. We thought we know the area quite well, but we could not sometimes find our location. So we used the geotag of our smartphones. And when we came back on the CBS system, we transferred this data so that all the data that we collect can be used in the same system. We did some more quick work in other areas as well. Not also the not only the environment, but also the relation between human and environment and understand the needs correctly so that we could generate ideas. When we first went 
we did not even see even 10 people. We saw four or five people that we could talk to. We were lucky maybe the Zengina neighborhood where there's cultural heritage, the most intense way. We were able to run into the Muhtar of that neighborhood, the chief of the neighborhood. And during that field work, he helped us a lot so that together we were able to understand the area better and we could detect more problems together. After coming back from the field work, the data that we generated, we started interpreting it. We transferred it to the CBS system, the literature study that we did, and comparing it to other sources so that we could come up with certain principles for the future and to do some assessment. The results of it, with Kordar uh, to touch them and uh, we shared this as a joint activity and then we turned it into a report. It's important to reach decision makers. So the director of cultural assets and museums, we uh, sent this to the director general and his deputy. We made a presentation to them as well. Uh, to point out the principles that we should pay attention to. This report is freely accessible to everyone. All the maps and documents inside are at open access. It's still open access. If you're curious, you can reach it through touchdown.metro.tr. There are different revisions of the document as well, which are present as well. So after that, we, I would like to very quickly talk about our assessment, our evaluation, which relates to the information that we gathered, also our previous information and the research that we did later. So the problems about the geological structure, we all know it. I will not say in detail again, but the ground structure is problematic in many areas. There is live and dead fault lines. Also, the area around Asi River, there are there is a problematic ground structure uh, there, and the destruction was due to the alluvium uh, ground. Not only the ground structure, but there are other uh, attributes uh, as uh, as we could observe. Uh, the ground conditions are very important. So, first, the correct data should be gathered and the geological changes should be studied as well. Uh, and uh, so that updates can be made, up-to-date maps and reports should be prepared, and then in a transparent way, they should be shared so that a decision can be made about what can be done, what worked and did not work, what did happen and did not happen, not much did happen. Still, it can be done maybe, but uh, the geological structures, uh, we don't have information about the geological structure and it is almost going to be rebuilt. Uh, results will come soon and rebuilding will begin. But in fact, studies are not complete and without proper study, there could be problems. Milattan <gülüyor> Since the first age, there are problems and many researchers, some hypothetical, some uh, data-based uh, information had been generated. And we were lucky because in our working team, there were uh, people who, who knows uh, the region and archaeology uh, well. Arkeolojik katmanlarını da e, EBS sistemiyle birlikte baktığımızda aslında 
e, önemli olan şeyin hani çok farklı dönemlerdeki süreklilik alanlarını ve hatta orantesinde e, zaten nehir yatağının değiştiğini de görüyoruz. Riverbed changes and several other vulnerabilities also should be paid attention to. When we think of the archaeological layer that's currently there, we should be very, very careful about that. And for the upcoming constructions, we need to pay attention to the fragilities. We need to come up with the right strategies. Hatice, Professor Hatice always brought up this following agenda item. There are so many substrata in this region, and she's going to probably talk about that in the later stages, and they all have different layering stories. That's why decisions going forward should not be one and wholesale, but specific to each layer. And our studies showed us the following. We should not just consider geological properties, but we should uh, we we actually encounter different micro levels. So, for example, some street would look absolutely undamaged by the earthquake, and the one right next to it was completely collapsed. And considering the archaeological layers, here's what we thought: there are sub levels that had been destroyed hundreds of years ago, and then on top of those collapses in previous centuries there were new constructions some of them for example some of the constructions had been built on former rubble and some of them had been just uh, new territories so we are talking about heterogeneity which comes up comes along uh, brings along different levels of vulnerability so this layering is very important as a value and at the same time, it needs to be very much uh, within our consideration going forward. So constructions should definitely put these factors into consideration. It's not just about protection, but we need to be very, very attentive when removing rubble after earthquake as well. If there are archaeological layers, they need to be documented, recovered, and also protected we underlined the importance of that of that as well and when we have general decisions we should also pay attention to further layers uh, into into the soil and we should not just have wholesale decisions some of these could not be realized this is still something that needs further attention although the plans are decided on right now there are still being considered. We need to document the layers and we need to pay attention to removing rubble. Unfortunately, we haven't been really successful in these activities and we're going to document you with photos. Another important issue in Antakya is property um, ownership. And there is a PhD thesis on that, especially uh, deep studies uh, were carried out connecting the uh, geography and the property ownership. When we look at the planning of ownership in this region, we see a very long story history going back, and we have also seen how deeply rich it gets. Every study should focus on multiculturalism and also the uh, ownership because Antakya has so many important values, we need to really make sure that the original plans should not be damaged. And there are also spaces that belong to certain individuals, groups, and communities. And there should be a high level of participation when it comes to ownership. And we are not just talking about the ownership of constructed areas, but open air spaces also enable a lot of social relations and all of these should be considered together our concern is the following this is just not about tourism this is a living space where people live that's why we should not have one and wholesale decision so when we look at, for example, the cadastral uh, situation and ownership situations, we see a lot of damage. Property owners are not exactly participating in decisions. That's a bit of a question mark. Some of these 
are a little bit too late, but still there are areas that we can pay attention to and save. And there are streets and public open spaces. There is a continuity that has been with us since ancient times. You see these open air spaces. We see uh, a web of streets, including dead ends, that have been here since ancient times. And we're talking about communal living spaces. Faith and daily life go together in these areas. And there's several theses that are written on this specific issue. We see how not only built environment, but open air spaces are very important in Antakya. A lot of cultures and faiths actually use these open air spaces within their habits. So post earthquake, we have seen so many problems. Like I've said, the first phase was about setting the right method. Uh, we wanted to figure out the accessibility open air spaces to find out how accessible they were, how, what we needed to do, how uh, much integrity are we talking about. As you can see, this street looks like it has complete integ integrity, but right next to it, you see complete collapse. So we have all the data as much as we can uh, collect, and there were also risks, collapse and fall risks uh, of wall pieces that surround that encircle these open air spaces. There are building elements that needed to be cleared away and the risks needed to be eliminated. We thought it would be very important to make sure that open air spaces were back into use. As you see, uh, we have in-situ uh, findings and we wanted to especially mark them uh, to make sure that they uh, receive the attention that they deserve going forward. So with all the streets and dead ends, all these areas have a certain level of continuity. It's, we thought, very important to preserve the streets as they were, along with ownership rights. We should act to make sure that we know about how specific Antakis we're talking about temples and faith spaces and natural elements. Uh, there are very, very important social and cultural elements, and they are of priority uh, when it comes to recovery. Uh, they are very important in terms of enabling accessibility. But we did face challenges, and especially in the upcoming term, I'm going to show you with photos. So when you think of streets and squares, a lot of them uh, have no traces left. We need to preserve the traces, we said, but unfortunately, we lost a lot of them, most of them in this process. So at different periods, uh, Antakya has have has had different settlements and you see vertical and horizontal lines you see how there are layers that are built on top of one another and there are there are layers that are right next to each other so building techniques materials and culture have changed over time and we see a certain level of evolution which brings along richness but as well uh, it brings fragilities so you see the bottom side of the structure has a different technique and the upper, uh, the lower side has a different technique. The upper side has a different technique. So different techniques are brought together at different stages, which bring along problems. So we wanted to first come, come up with the damage assessment uh, from no damage to complete collapse. So we saw in a certain structure, for example, we would have a complete facade collapse while other parts had just minor damage. So we looked at all of these specific areas specifically. So we set priorities for each of them in terms of intervention. Again, this was more method based as a study. One of the most important aspects of our study was to understand the reasons of damage, because when you know about the history of damage in a certain structure, you have an idea about why that same damage repeats. 
this gives you uh, a very good guide in reconstructing that specific structure going forward. When we look at what's happened in Antakya, at the root of it, we have five reasons of destruction. First, geological ground-based uh, reasons and settlement continuity and layering because there are sub-levels which are associated with its fragility and uh, heterogeneity. And then third, unique um, construction methods for changes made over time. And fifth, even though one structure might not have any had any damage, the ad adjacent uh, juxtaposing structures might have collapsed on top of the undamaged one. We need to remember one thing about Antakya. When we look at the documentation post-earthquake, we have seen the following. There were so many fragilities that we hadn't realized before. For example, damages due to uh, original uh, methods. There were, for example, uh, the grid systems that were on a horizontal level. And also there were rotting wooden pieces, beams had been uh, very much uh, damaged. As you see, for example, the mortar is very, very weak. And you see how there is no integration between, uh, there are no binding materials inside the walls. And it shows very well how it's not possible for uh, such a building to resist the earthquake especially when we think of uh, stone masonry buildings, if they are very thin, like for example, we saw just 30 centimeters of thickness of wall for a three story building, or in the corners, the connecting elements were not rightly integrated and there were irregularities in the grid and the niches on the interior were very large in number and the wall depth was very low. So these were some of the problems that we faced when we assessed the damage. So this was about the method. It's important to find out what is caused by the method of building because we are told that the same methods will be used to rebuild the same structures, but given the circumstances, it's not going to be possible. That's our conclusion. And then we had uh, structural system interventions that also caused damage. So some of the modifications might have been done um, earlier, like for example, during the French mandate, steel profiles were used to add a new layer, add a new floor to the building or in later stages in uh, more recent times, uh, there were new functions that were added to certain buildings. That was something that surprised us in Antakya before. So reinforced concrete was put in, even though stone masonry was still used in the same buildings. So actually, reinforced concrete played a very large role in high levels of damage during the earthquake because the walls would completely explode and pancake. Uh, and there were also changes made to the buildings on their facades. And um, as changes were made to the functions and doors and window openings uh, were changed, that were those were also reasons behind damage. In the first field work that we had with Ahmed Turaj, we uh, worked in situ and also we worked in the evening. So we found out about bad materials used and uh, weaknesses within uh, and without the planes and binding uh, or connecting beams and the lack thereof. And those were the main reasons behind damage. And there were also adjacent building collapses that caused damage. So we have historical layering. So we need to really uh, consider all of these buildings. They might or they might not be registered. It doesn't matter. We should not ignore the ones that are not unregistered from the ancient times to 
current times there is a continuity that we see over time certain necessities required certain changes but that those changes caused a lot of damage we need to pay attention there but at the same time there are weaknesses in original method of building so we should not repeat the mistakes that were made with the original method of building first of all we should uh, very much look into the physical and mechanical properties of the materials. The reconstruction process has not completely begun. Hopefully, we will have a very detailed view of the whole situation in the reconstruction phase. We need to respect the originality of the buildings and uh, the structures, but we need to also take into consideration the vulnerabilities, the fragilities of the ground, and especially what changes over time contributed. And we need to also take into consideration climate change and similar other issues. We need to take precautions for upcoming problems, including climate change. And we need to also consider other necessities that might arise in the future. So these were the pieces of advice that we came up with. And all of this can be enabled through groups uh, of relevant specializations to come together. So archaeolo archaeologists, geologists, civil engineers and architects should come together. Further disciplines should also be involved. Unless we have all of them involved, we cannot guide the process in the right way. We also should come up with a technical guide for recovery and rehabilitation. This is yet to be done. Unfortunately, some of the structures that could have been recovered do not stand with us, but we should still pay attention to the other things that we have. Rubble removal was very important at the time. Antakya went through severe damage and it still has the traces. We are talking about people who could not reach their loved ones. Everyone was saying, well, everyone should be as careful to remove rubbles uh, as they would be for archaeological purposes. But we said we need to be really, really careful in what we do. We should have protection uh, specialists, art historians and archaeologists involved all of, in all of these efforts but unfortunately they were not there. And um, the general director of cultural properties and museums should be uh, involved, we said, but unfortunately they were not involved either. And like we always say, universities, ECOMOS uh, should also be contributing. We said all of the uh, universities were ready to help. ECOMOS also said they were ready to help and professional organizations said they were ready to help. We said we could just go in there and uh, support, but we were not consulted for support. Unfortunately, rubble removal had so many problems. So we said access to open air spaces are important, but we need to really remove the rubble very carefully. Owners of the property should be informed. We're talking about fragile structures. That's why we should come up with supporting beams and supporting structures because we don't want further damage. Because at the time, a lot of structures could have been saved. But we could not see that happening. During rubble removal, again, we wanted to make sure that materials should be kept in a certain place and that was what the general director of the cultural properties and museum said as well we wanted to separate recyclable materials but at the same time materials that could damage uh nature or humans should be separated but said we should also pay attention to these structures that can survive on their own Unfortunately, a lot of these goals could not be achieved. There are some that can still be achieved partially, but rubble is largely removed. How did we remove the rubble? Last time we were there, here's what it looked like. Unfortunately, to remove the rubble, uh, the companies that were involved were not at all careful in what they did. 
So they wanted to they wanted to separate the uh, steel, but they were damaging the nearby structures. It was supposed to be extremely sensitive, but unfortunately, it was very sad to see what happened. So layers should be paid attention to. The public uh, space access should be uh, paid attention to, we said. But like we've said, General Directorate of Cultural Properties and Museums said ground elevation is the last level that we're going to uh, remove the rubble from, they said. But we saw a lot of damage to archaeological areas. So, for example, here what you say, a very important area was removed thinking that it was rubble, but we found with our archaeologists that uh, late Roman Empire layers were also removed with along with the along with what was thought as rubble. Here we don't have a very bright picture either. So how can we re reuse this rubble? Was a question that we uh, that we asked ourselves. How can we classify? But none of those were ans answered in the right way. Of course, the biggest issue was how people could not even enter their homes, even though they were there. Some of the ho homes were not immediately collapsed; they collapsed all of a sudden, or there were very very important issues of security. We still follow through messages uh, that there are so many cases of theft and security issues at the end of the day people try to find solutions themselves they cannot even be called solutions but you see for example there's a note here god sees you it basically is a note from uh the property owner to potential uh people who might damage so you we could not even figure out where does the street finish where does the square begin so the paving stones of the street uh, could have been saved, but we really lost hundreds of years of material. And there were structures that we assessed were not damaged, but some of them uh, were collapsed later on. The last time we were there, we saw massive gaps like this, massive hollows like this, Unfortunately, we could not uh, see what we wanted to see. As you can see, the ground uh, ground elevation is way up, and there are traces of archaeological layers, and we have lost all of this as well. As you can see, there is a layer that is revealed. Of course, we focused on where there and was historical fabric, but we should not divide the city from its rest, and we should look at it in a holistic way, as uh, other professors also said. Uh, we, uh, together, uh, we discussed that it should be handled holistically, and infrastructure work should be prioritized so that life can start. This is a place with multiple players, and we should agree on a common grounds, and city management should be also done with multiple players, uh, and policies should be developed accordingly. To what extent this was ensured? That's a big question mark. So there were other things that happened during the process as well. There was the decree that scared us, which was declaring it a risk area. But a protocol was signed between the ministry and directorate, and authority was given uh, to the directorate. But afterwards, uh, there were problems that we could foresee because when it was declared a risk area, a nationalization would be faster and ownership rights could be weakened usually. I won't go into more detail. Uh, the laws 306, when it was first written, it was about all other laws, but with the then revision, the 
it was not about the law concerning cultural heritage, cultural assets, but still there are interesting things taking place here, especially when you look at the practice. Uh, the Cultural Assets Directorate and Foundations Directorate are in charge. The Foundations Directorate for many monuments that is under their authority has created scientific committees in order to run the process more carefully. But when you look at the historical city in its entirety, how the process continued, we all know, unfortunately, that is why we have the concern, the fear to lose. It should be slow, planning should be done carefully. Steps, some improvement steps should be taken without plans. The plan is ready, it is about to go public. It should be participatory, transparent and scientific. It's not only about making presentations in a number of meetings, but rather including people in the process. To what extent that will be? That's a big question mark as well. To what extent the organization, scientific or vocational professional organization could participate? Many groups did a lot of work, but to what extent were they included in the process? Not much we can say. Also, the original social fabric of the city, to what extent it was taken into consideration, also a big question mark. What we said was there were multiple parties, even if nothing else, there should be uh, for principles, a center of principles, a MOU between these parties to be used after the earthquake. The parties should agree on this MOU and continue accordingly. Now, fortunately, that did not happen either. So as a result of this process, we did the reporting and we did this pre uh, presentation to the ministry. At the time, the ministry took it seriously, uh, found it not worthy, but uh, they said uh, Otis uh, Metos work could continue. We said we could continue it with the local support without including them in the process. We could not do anything, we said. On June 2, we held a meeting at the architecture depart department of the university. We in invited representatives of local organizations and NGOs. They came and shared their ideas with us and their concerns. We shared bilaterally and discussed how we could continue. But afterwards, the elections happened, unfortunately, as you know, and many things did change after the elections. After the elections, a very quick uh, change of direction happened. After our local meeting, we did a field work once again as well. And our goal was to agree, as we agreed with the minister, to create a document which could be a guiding document at the structure, at the scale of structure and area, and to contribute uh, to the city by uh, coming up with certain focal points. So our goal uh, this time as we went to the field was to come up with technical and spatial policies, technical policies to do work and findings. We did this with this team and we received support from the local, especially Kenar Kantajolo. I must mention his support with us. He was in the field. He is a, a mapping engineer, a cartographer, and he was with us with his document. So we got great support from the local and we set up the priority areas. We designated them. These are generator areas which could accelerate. There were 12 uh, uh, points that we designated for different reasons. Uh, they were maybe a production center for Antakya or they were a religious center or we had set up such focal areas, their definition, significance, their situation before and after the earthquake, improvement potential, and the kind of intervention needed. We put all of these into a report that was our goal. We went to all of these areas that we designated and we went and met with more people by talking to these people. We discussed the problems, the concerns, what we could do and, and how it could contribute to improvement. So as a result of this, after we came back from the field, we reported 
for all of these spots, uh, we defined it, its situation before the earthquake, after the earthquake, the intervention process for the field the and the improvement potential. We prepared the report for each point. And in our first field study, we observed structural weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and what should be taken into account in the uh, following construction. So the residences, which are cultural heritage, they have uh, characteristics from different time periods. So depending on damage, for instance, least damaged or most damaged, we uh, selected some structures accordingly. As you can see, it is five structures. They all represent something different. We documented them in detail with their behavior under earthquake load and their performance. We is, try to designate the parameters for this and for this, we, we de gave more detail, for instance, height, thickness, measurement. With all of these parameters, we uh, collected data which is needed for technical parameters. The structure uh, typologies are important because it shows connection to different time periods uh, and the homes that are selected. Uh, we did laser scanning for documentation and then we generated the drawings. Some of them were structures that we previously studied. So we had information about their situation before the earthquake. So by looking at them together, why there was this much damage and what should be done in reparation, our goal was to express these. These are some examples from the structures that we worked on with different documents that we had, we compared to create such a table, different parameters, variants, variables, and their impact. And we reported this as well, uh, such residences and their shared attributes. So afterwards, the third field study started. We went in September. Until then, we were going with hope for recovery we there was hope even the situation was bad uh, we were thinking what we could do at the scale of the area our goal in this round was to look at our findings once again in situ but the third time we went to the field we saw that higher level decisions and the very fast debris removal process uh, left almost nothing in the field with the support of CR, we were running the project voluntarily so far. And after that, by taking a fund from cultural emergency response, we had the chance to do the work in a more detailed way. And within this scope, we went once again for the project. But as the photos were showing you, in the field, the 12 areas that we thought would improve were entirely lost. The areas that we thought the neighborhood could, could improve, even if they were in good situation, they were entirely demolished. We had despair, a lack of hope at one point. What are we going to improve? Because we have so little left. The photo that you see here, this was a well-preserved area that we thought could be a good focus for improvement. There were structural problems, but not nothing serious. Uh, we saw that it was demolished entirely and it was a debris area now when we went. There are such neighborhoods like this, but they do not exist at all anymore. This is how they look now. Almost nothing is left for rehabilitation here, as you can see, there was a structure here and that structure was a measure, structure that we measured because we were curious how it got so little damage, but it was entirely lost as well. The archeological levels, it was, they were experiencing serious problems. On the one hand, at the periphery of the city, the, where there were archaeological uh, layers, there were stand set up, so their vulnerability had increased. 
this is what came out of the structure, certain elements, they were stored in such archaeological areas. For instance, the photo from our previous visit, it was a well-preserved fabric. And the next time we go, all of them were taken down. So the only good thing was that Professor Emre, one of the significant professors of Middle East Technical University, whom we have lost. We Every year we do Emre Madran events. This year we wanted to do it in the earthquake area. That's what he would have wanted. So when we were in the field, many people participated with the Ankara branch of the Chamber of Architects and uh, Hatay Chamber. We organized Emre Madran conference uh, under the title of uh, Societal Rehabilitation uh, through Cultural Heritage Post-Earthquake. We did this at the Atatürk Park, uh, which is a significant park for Antakya. The local participation was important for us. We wanted to discuss together how we could rehabilitate. We wanted to learn from them as well. It was very helpful. We did learn a lot. We met again. We discussed again because of the location even people who were walking in the park were able to join and share their opinions. It was a shared discussion platform that we achieved during this event. We had little hope, but discussing with the local population, especially seeing the hope in the young people who were joining the meeting, it gave us hope once again. So we come to the last stage. I have presented what we have done so far, and as a result of this process, all the work that we have done so far and what happened the last time we visited, we turned it into a report and presented to CER. We will share it with you openly as well. During the process, other things happened as well. A decision was made on in situ uh, transformation. The plan was completed and launched. Uh, this was declared the reserve area. These are processes that affect the area and its inhabitants very negatively. There were some decisions made on the owners of structures, which all caused morale to go lower, but we can't, we don't have the luxury to lose our morale. We, if we continue thinking what we could continue doing, we lost many of the structures. And since we know the decision-making, in order to, so, even if we produce something to support decision making, to what extent they will use it, we don't know. We will share everything we have with everyone. But what we have decided to do is, as we started at the beginning of the earthquake, the geographical information system, with the support of Kenan Kantarjolu, by adding the new photos, new documents, we will try to see our loss better. Uh, we will turn it into an open access database so that we can share it with everyone. And secondly, to look at what else we can do uh, for rehabilitation, developing new strategies for open public spaces. For instance, the last meeting was held in the middle coffee house, which showed us that uh, public spaces were still trying to survive by rehabilitating them. We could ensure some rehabilitation as well. Uh, they have lost, children have lost their playground, their open spaces, outdoor areas, uh, historical in historical fabric. Uh, open spaces are important as well. We will try to create our proposals and share it with the municipality so that we could contribute as much as we can. This is the reserve area, risk area. There were such issues, but with our outdoor areas and with the city, and the uh, dwellers of the city are trying to rehabilitate themselves. And how can the historical fabric be rehabilitated? We will continue coming up with ideas. We do hope that what we do will contribute to the rehabilitation of Antakya. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Giliz Oja. Uh, you have taken us through an enormous amount of work that you and your team, everyone together, has uh, has done, and uh, made it very clear how much uh, how much you've achieved 
and manage to do and how how clear it has become that this can only be done through the sort of interdisciplinary team uh, that uh, has worked on this, whether it is about geology or archaeology or architecture or engineering. These are all extremely valuable. Uh, and the, the how impressive your work is uh, makes it even more sort of disheartening to see how um, uh, what what has happened after the earthquake, and especially with uh, also the new problems that were created, and that makes it much more difficult to uh, uh, achieve a positive outcome. Uh, and it's just, I think, uh, like you were saying at the end, it's a matter of uh, trying to find ways of supporting the local community as much as possible in however they want to. Uh, rebuild their lives and however wherever they see possibilities and where they see uh, sort of light at the end of the tunnel uh, that should maybe be guiding us in uh, in next steps um, i'm sure there's many questions but uh, first we'll uh, move on to uh, the second part where uh, several of the team members of the uh, project will give very brief reflections based on their own expertise. Um, and uh, the first one that will speak uh, is Duigo Ergenc, who is a, a geological engineer and a faculty member at, uh, at METU. Duigo, go ahead. Thank you, Fokke. Yes, as Foke mentioned, I'm a geological engineer who specializes on preservation, and I'm proud of the work that we do, the voluntary work that we have initiated, as was presented. I will not give any detailed information because it's possible to see more detailed information in the report, but maybe I can say the following. In this work, in the year 2002, there was a geological map that was prepared by MTA. On top of the GIS, we overlaid the geological map, which could help us interpret because we knew that Antakya was on very uh, on bad grounds. Everyone knew this, but this was the way to show it scientifically, and that is what we did. Then. The hippodrome or the little Dalian being included in our future work, it was based on alluvions and it was sitting on a weak ground, including the fishery, that broader area. And in the middle of Antakya, through the Kurtulush highway, there are active fault lines, which we also indicated on the map so that in future, work it could be the base and people could act uh, being aware of that during this process as we mentioned in our initial report it was difficult to access data uh, or the minister of tourism data were not very easily accessible and we mentioned that in the report as well and obviously our work was very fast being carried out and our group became larger so tamar from geology department contributed as well in and with that hatay municipality had this micro region uh, regioning uh, study report from 2018 and that was good news for us because we could have a better matching uh, and um comparison because we had already gone over the other sites in previous studies and we also had other studies uh, simultaneously so when we overlapped the data we found that there was no overlapping actually because the study uh, does not include uh, the urban zones but so when we went back in September and saw everywhere completely uh, collapsed when we saw for example narrow streets and in the narrow street when, where there used to be historical structures, geotechnical and geological work would be very, very difficult because you cannot 
bring in large uh, equipment. So the most recent data was from 2018, uh, and that was the missing bit. And actually, an idea popped up, a question popped up in our heads in September, because we saw completely flattened out space in September. And we said, OK, a micro regioning was going to be done. But what we saw, uh, and we couldn't really figure out why, was the following. Well, of course, we could figure out why, but we could not understand why specific sites were chosen for ex archaeological ex excavations. Geotechnical work was not being done based on our observations. So I hope that geotechnical work has been done since we went there in uh, September. Hopefully we'll see that soon. If not, they should be done because we're not talking about very easily wrapped up projects. They should be presented in a transparent way. And is that going to be uh, done by MTA by uh, through the through the ministry, or will that will the project be subcontracted to companies? Those decisions are important, and. There are all these executive orders that are issued, and we believe that this issue needs a, a fast uh, executive order as well. Uh, this is it from me, and I would like to pass the floor to Professor Hatija. Thank you. Hatija, your, your microphone is off. Herkese merhabalar. Aslında Hello, everyone. Actually, Professor Gülez really gave a very good summary with the most important aspects. She emphasized all the right places, so I don't want to take a lot of your time. But I'd like to draw your attention to uh, one issue specifically. We always focused on the historical city. Of course, the area that's designated uh, for the historical city, we know about that. We know its fragilities. We know about its ground structures. But actually, these fragilities are not just limited to the historical city, because when you go up to the north and also the uh, uh, the suburban neighborhoods and also uh, the other side of the Asi River has archaeological layers, because we're talking about an enlarging and, uh, and dwindling area for mentioned times, because it was reshaped over the history and it was relayered over the history. So when we think of all of these fragilities, and when we come up with uh, urban planning, the entire city should be considered as a whole. And this was what we said from the beginning, and I want to re-emphasize that, okay, the archaeological texture is very important, very valuable for the city. We want to own it, but at the same time, that should not be our own purpose, because if we are talking about a new urbanization, both elements should be considered at the same time. And Professor Gulez uh, pointed that out in a very emphasized way. So I'll join you again in the Q&A, and this is the general framework that I would like to give you. Thank you. Thank you, Hati Georgia. And now the um, microphone will go to Özgün Öztaker, who is assistant professor and architect at uh, METU and also the chair of CORDA. Özgün? Hello, everyone. I am I am not uh, I'm not an assistant professor I'm just an a PhD student so I would not want to misguide pe uh, people here and I am also a board member of uh, Professor Gudis. Actually she explained things in a really nice way but uh, I would maybe want to retell one thing. So we specified the outdoor spaces. We said well actually we thought of areas that could rehabilitate people as people rehabilitated themselves because if a city rehabilitates that would also rehabilitate the society and we are talking about so many different communities who have different uh commercial activities like for example there are these uh, soap makers area and we thought uh about the industrial history of the city which 
this area, commercial area refers to, and different faith groups uh, have different temples, holy sites, and the Uzun Charge, the long uh, market, for example, that's a commercial area. So this is actually like a policy a document, uh, and we are still working on the sites in terms of designating them. And then we thought of the economic tools and political tools and through which tools we can really recover these areas. We're not just talking about the space. We need to rehabilitate them. Um, in order to rehabilitate these spaces, we need certain financial and legal tools. What kind of national and international support can we draw in the process? We're also trying to write that down. So in a nutshell for Antakya, uh, there are generator places that can rehabilitate itself and have rehabilitate the society in the meantime. What kind of actors should be involved? What kind of legal tools should we use? Well, legal instruments, legal tools might sound a little bit intimidating because actually some legal uh, instruments can be misused. Um, when we think of especially the post earthquake rehabilitation of or reconstruction of Antakya, but actually we should also come up with uh, ideas about economic tools that could help us. And I'll be back with you in the Q and A. If you have any other questions, I'll be back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Özgün. And we continue with the contribution by Selen Turul who is a PhD candidate at METU in the Urban Policy and Planning and Local Government Graduate Program, and she is uh, an urban planner. Hello, just like Foke said, actually, uh, parallel to this study, I'm a PhD student in uh, urban planning and policy making, and I study, I have a thesis that I started before the post uh, earthquake and I am looking into the motivations and dynamics of uh, protected areas uh, and the designation of protected areas and with the earthquake there's a new layer to my studies and uh, I have been having uh, stakeholders that uh, are involved in protected areas post earthquake so I would like to talk about a little bit about the information that I gathered for the purposes of the study. So I've had certain conversations, uh, interviews I worked, I've worked with uh, academics, NGO representatives, and uh, owners of registered properties, and different stakeholders have different approaches to the process. So these interviews and studies still carry on. The process is actively in progress and in changes as the days go by. But up to now, here are the areas that I found, especially. So in the decisions post earthquake, there are so many issues with transparency and local uh, society is not um, transparently informed of what's going on. Participation has been discussed from the day one, but stakeholders involvement at what level that's a huge question mark the affected area is massive the damage is massive which complicates obviously the entire management of the process and when we think of the stakeholders and um, also the workers in relevant areas that these issues are really raised very often we have uncertainty we have transparency issues we have lack of information and all of these especially for architects academics NGO um, uh, workers and um, other people talk about these issues a lot so NGOs had a call that uh, pointed out how cultural properties were not going to be damaged and they said, well, uh, right owners should have no reason to uh, come up with complaints. But there were tenders that took place that included the registered uh, areas too. And the collapse of the uh, registered areas were also begun in May. So some of the property owners uh, Came up with the uh, came up with the information about how 
those damaged structures would be collapsed. Uh, they, they found out about it really by chance. So people had their personal efforts to uh, go to court to stop the um, the collapse of the buildings. So we found how the owners of the properties were very much disadvantaged and some of the owners could not find any information at, at all and they had to go to so many different places to find out what they needed social media information was not very easy and they found themselves in a very difficult position and the relevant authorities said well do not intervene we have to demolish these buildings there is no other possibility so there is one th other thing that's very important so lack of information that has been given to stakeholders and that uncertainty that lack of transparency created a lot of concern and uh, anxiety among the local communities and the local communities were left to leave uh the affected areas so as individuals could not come up with what to look forward to and even if they can endure the entire process, they say that they can just sell uh, their properties be because what they're looking at is a process that's very, very complicated because going forward, there is no clearly defined process for what is going to happen to the buildings. In a nutshell, even uh, without the other factors, uh, just a sense of uncertainty could change ownership in this area. So these are some of the areas that uh, have stood out in what we have done so far, but I don't want to take too much of my time uh, to talk about other things. We can carry on with Q&A afterwards. Thank you, Celine. Uh, and we go on with the next contribution by Professor Niriman Shaheen Guchan who is the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture at Middle East Technical University and a professor at, uh, at the same university in the Department of Architecture, the Graduate Program in Conservation of Cultural Heritage. Niri Mananja. Thank you, Fokke. It's a very, very challenging period. And despite all the efforts that we put in, we could not really see anything positive in terms of development so far. So as part of this study, I was involved in a group that focused on the structures. Uh, so Professor Gudis talked about uh, that bit as well. And I will just give you several details if that's okay. Because yes, everything goes badly, but where to begin if we are to correct certain things? We need to really uh, ask, keep asking questions and carry on. So these structures are demolished, collapsed and destroyed, but we do have the drawing or um, uh, drawings of these or documentations of these buildings. And if we start working on them and if we're going to see those buildings reconstructed, because we cannot talk about restorations because they're very, very damaged. If we're going to reconstruct them, are they going? Are they supposed to be rebuilt based on their original structure? That was a, the main question we had. Because starting from the first field study, the residences and also uh, monuments had so many construction mistakes before they were destroyed. If these mistakes are repeated during reconstruction, they would face the risk of a similar destruction later on. So we considered this aspect. Engineers, architects and decision makers should be given a technical guide, uh, which we wanted to uh, come up with. We have three parts in this guide. The first one includes uh, the findings about the monuments and the residences. So we have had laser scanning of buildings uh, from the sections or from the uh, damaged areas. We wanted to come up with 
certain data. So we worked with lasers, laser scans on three monuments, and then we studied six historical residences. So we did a laser scanning of six residences. So here was the purpose. Normally in such a tissue, if you are going to uh, do a repair or reconstruction, of course, you need to know about the architectural elements, but that's not enough because the construction technique itself has so many wrong bits. A few examples. Professor Gulis very quickly went over all of them. One of them was uh, the following. So there were two gr four groups of these structures. Uh, so parts of them were built in the post-1872 earthquake. So there were one story stonemason buildings, stonemasonry buildings, and they were the most original Antakya homes. And then in later stages, La later floors were added or the or a drying so-called drying floor were added the second group of buildings included the following so the new traditional ones new traditional residences and actually they're specific to antakya as you know uh iskander is like a port of antakya so in turkey's geography Iskenderun is a very, very large uh, port and new construction materials were and were uh, penetrating into the city through Iskenderun port from uh, the 19th century on. So there were also railroad constructions in the region and we know that the, the transfers from the port increased the pace of the railroad constructions. So, for example, you would have stone masonry, multi-windowed and adjacent uh, juxtaposed um, rooms on the first floor of a single story building. And then a uh, steel floor, steel structure floor would add, would be added on top of the, that first story uh, house. So this was actually uh, the advent, the beginning of a new phase of new tradition but here's the weakness when you think of steel profiles ships were used to carry them but the binding elements were not brought in so the construction masters did not know how to bind the steel profiles they thought steel would last long but actually because they were not bound well to the stonemason part of the first floor it caused a lot of problems and then the french period came in reinforced concrete began during the french mandate and these steel profiles were included in uh in about 12 centimeter length we saw them from the sections post earthquake and neoclassical forms were used. So, for example, on Kurtulish Street, uh, we have buildings of this kind, and then you had uh, expanded streets during the French mandate, and then houses on those sides. And then the last group has a more modern version. So, you have bricks and reinforced concrete that are used together. So, the first report, the first part of the report talks about precise that because if you do the reconstruction badly, just the aesthetic part of the architectural side is not going to work. It's not going to be enough. So that was the first part of the report. And the second part of the report showed examples, pre-earthquake, post-earthquake, from each structure group with the measured data. Well, Jim, can you go on to explain uh, the... Can you slowly wrap up? Okay, okay, I will. Uh, sorry. Uh, bu, bu detayları, sorunları Ahmet Tüce biraz daha anlatır ama... Ahmet Tüce, I will talk about these details, but what I would like to say is that at the root of it all, these structures have damages due to construction methods and what to do in order to not repeat them. This is what we described in the last part, and our engineer... Uh, friends, Ahmed Sadiq uh, can help with with those about the pro ground as well. So, 
along with them, we came up with several suggestions. So we're not just talking about supporting a single type of architectural technique. So uh, the technical team should be informed duly for further reconstruction. So this is the purpose of the guide in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne Manoja. We go on uh, with uh, Ahmed Ture, who is a civil engineer and professor at Middle East Technical University. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Foke. And it's a great pleasure to be among so many familiar faces. And I wish a good evening to everyone. As a civil engineer during the earthquake, some structures were not demolished and they shared three attributes. They were first lightweight, they were ductile, and they were strong. They had strong materials. So in bulk structures, they are not light, they are vulnerable, they have a not a strong uh, material. Uh, it is very natural that they are demolished at the earthquake, such masonry construction, uh, stack construction. Those who are not demolished have low rise, they have good ground, they have good material, especially one of them who was using cement uh, plaster. It was a, a church, there were no cracks, uh, there was a lock mechanism inside the uh, wall itself, uh, and there were also uh, lentils on the uh, corners. There were thick uh, walls because slender uh, walls uh, are demolished, and there were small rooms, not big rooms, but uh, small rooms which were locking into each other. And some of them had component masonry, which means it was either a uh, cement a pillar, a beam, or steel around. So, for that reason, it was very chaotic, most structures, but especially heavy, vulnerable, and weak material ones. These are very important. So, when we rebuild them, it should not be demolished again. It should not collapse and kill so many people. Either we should focus on the positive attributes that I mentioned, or we will go towards the hills, we will use more resilient structure uh, materials, or we will do something else inside. They're all collapsed now, or we will use steel, wood, cement in some places, or hybrid. The outside appearance should be the same, but inside the material should be a little bit different. Uh, we should find solution like this. In the new legislation, earthquake legislation, there is new impacts being studied. For instance, the basin impact, the basin influence, it's like a bowl of jelly, my professor from the US said. It is like a big bowl of jelly. Uh, continuously, it is being shaken, it's being quaked, uh, and it's a basin effect which increases the earthquake effect. In Antakya, something similar happened. When it comes to civil engineering, infrastructure is important for me as well, because not only buildings, but also clean water, roads, streets, sewage systems, airport, port. And after the earthquake, for instance, the bakery, the security, theft happens, or there are attacks on people, it is rumored. Our team had uh, civil engineering, geology, uh, different disciplines, and uh, in the outcomes, you say this as well, it was multi-layered uh, as a study, and it continues to be so. In the field visit, maybe urgent measures should be taken, but they rather uh, collapsed everything with bulldozers, uh, those who are uh, standing should be supported as, could have been supported as urgent measure against, for instance, uh, asbestos or uh, the risk of collapse or uh, fall. There were bodies 
uh, or food that was not excavated, so there was terrible smell coming from it. Gulli Zoja divided damage into five geological layers, uh, construction techniques, modification over time, and uh, other structure falling on this structure. So as civil engineers, number three and four, original techniques and modifications over time are maybe things that we can prevent from a civil engineering uh, standpoint. For instance, a wooden turning, being turned into cement, maybe it is preferable in some areas, but uh, that layering is heavy and it could make a damage into the existing masonry wall. For that reason, I think this is a, for instance, prob problem replacing wooden flooring. Another impact is the lack of diaphragm impact uh, or using small stone, wooden lentils uh, being decayed or asymmetry problems. Uh, we did not talk about heavy roof. Over a wooden structure, there were very heavy uh, bricks, uh, walls being slender which means thin but tall or later additions or opening the corners or lack of walls that do not support each other at 90 degrees uh, walls going too long or too tall so in such earthquake areas lower than two higher than two floors is risky the uh, inner and outside uh, faces of walls being opened or the mortar being like sand or the sizes uh, of windows being too big or the niches being present inside the walls. These are some of the notes that I noted down. These are some elements that I wanted to share with you. We continue studying. We will continue sharing. Thank you for your attention and have a good evening. Thank you very much, Ahmed Ojan. Uh, the next contribution comes from Mert Rifaiolo, who is uh, an architect and an associate professor at uh, Iskenderun Technical University. Mert, go ahead. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Fokke. Good evening to everyone. So, in the field study, as well as in the structure study, I am taking part within this study. I'm a local academic and I've been studying Antakya for 25 years. Many things have been mentioned already, so maybe I can mention the following. In our study at the area scale and structure scale, the city's all parameters, we try to include all parameters of the city. In the area study, for instance, the agricultural culture, uh, religious areas, monumental spaces, or multilayerism or horizontal layers. We try to focus on spatial structures. At the structure scale, both civilian architecture and monuments, we analyze both of them. And also between different terms, different periods, we focus some structures based to reflect the differences between time periods so that we could understand their differences and their earthquake behavior. Our goal was to approach the city in a holistic way without being localized, without localizing in a street or neighborhood, looking at all the parameters of the city in their entirety. And doing this at every layer, sharing with, with the local, uh, feeding from the local and exchanging opinions with the local, we put a lot of attention to this because I live in the earthquake area continuously and it's something that I observe, which motivates the study and gives hope, is that the local is very supportive and trusts our study and exchanges opinions with us at every stage. It makes us happy and gives us hope. Thank you very much. That's my brief contribution. Thank you, Matt, for that. Uh, and uh, the next contribution comes from uh, Pinar Aikaj Lightholm, uh, an architect who is a social professor at METU in the architecture uh, faculty and also vice dean of the faculty of architecture. Pinar, go ahead. Thank you very much, Fokke. It was mentioned many times 
but so maybe I can just make a couple additions. As Professor Nerma said, we focused on residences because when it comes to monuments, the Directorate of Foundations uh, had scientific boards uh, which uh, thought about how to inter uh, intervene, how to respond to uh, monuments. So we focused on residences or homes, especially we studied the traditional ones, but at the first part of the report, we looked at the entire housing reper uh, repertoire of Antakya. By that, I mean uh, the French mandate period, early Republic, 1940s, initial uh, apartment buildings, standalone houses, or in the 60s or 70s modern residences, for instance, the collapsed Viryamazarolu's structures, some of them are included as well. So for all of them, these are part of the cultural heritage of Antakya. When it comes to layers, everyone mentioned through the residences, horizontal and vertical layers, we continue seeing them. There is layerization in the city as well, but also on structures, there are, for instance, traditional ones underneath, but in 40s and 50s, the upper layer changed. Uh, so we see the stratification uh, at every scale uh, from the, let's say, city scale to structures. And all this stratification, unfortunately, was leveled at the current situation, leveled entirely. Maybe that is what I can add. How we Antakya can have this once again in the future, maybe we can discuss this during the question part. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Panara. Let's let's hope so that we can uh, address these issues during the question and answer session. Uh, thank you to all the uh, contributors that made valuable additions to uh, the uh, presentation by Gulis Hoja. Before I open the floor for uh, questions from the audience, I would like to ask Gulis Hoja whether she has any final additions to make after having heard the other contributors. Thank you very much. I talked quite long at the beginning, so I don't want to take any longer. Maybe just a few concerns or questions. As we saw, it, we could have been bigger and have more disciplines, but we try to be as comprehensive and multidisciplinary as possible. And during the process, to the extent we can, we try to do everything with the local. I hope that in this work here, it could be better. And I'd like to thank everyone who supported us during the process. But still, we do have some concerns. As Punar mentioned, Antakya is a very complicated place. That complication is what forms its identity. In the construction, for instance, like theater stage or reflecting only one time period, such uh, buildings could be produced. That is our concern. The modern time period is also valuable, like as well as the Ottoman. So it's not, but it's not discussed enough. The early Republic has been lost as well. In some places, there are archaeological excavations with that concerns us because it will be, maybe it will be an excuse that it will not be a settlement a residential area once again unfortunately the process is not well planned so far in our last meeting we had a psychologist from the local and what she said was very important for instance if we would like to rehabilitate uh, together with space we must uh, put brick on top of brick with the local community and we should try and complete the story that was interrupted and we should start uh, questioning and thinking on how we can achieve this. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gulis Oja. Uh, several people have mentioned uh, that uh, important uh, principle in the whole project has been that um, uh, everyone felt that it was very important to integrate uh, expertise from uh, local uh, 
community members, and that's been uh, uh, done throughout. And I think uh, many people from Atai have made, uh, from Antakya have made very important contributions uh, to the project. Uh, and uh, a number of these people are also here in the audience. And uh, uh, I could imagine that some of them might want to um, give some feedback or make a, a very brief uh, contribution themselves. Um, uh, so those, I think, before we open it up for general questions, might be invited first to um, uh, to open the microphone. Uh, what I would ask is uh, that people that would like to say something uh, maybe use the raise hand function um, so that I can see who uh, wants to say something. Um, what we've observed in the audience is, for example, that uh, Kenan Kantarje is with us and uh, we would be interested in hearing his feedback or uh, Murat Tenegeji Olu uh, or Kenan Yurtagul, Mustafa Özcelik, uh, Serkan Koç, uh, Ibrahim Gutschmann, uh all of these people that have uh, that I've just mentioned uh, have been very valuable and we would really very much appreciate their uh reaction their feedback or their questions um and if any of them would like to begin I'd be very happy to give them the microphone Or uh, if not, if there are other people that would like to ask questions, maybe they can use the raise hand function so that I see them on my screen. I don't know if I was given the floor, but... Yes, Kenan, yes, of course. Yes. First of all, thank you so, so much for all of your efforts. I was in tears as I listened to the report prepared by Middle East Technical University. And you reported what we experienced in the field. That was a very important step. There are a few things that I would like to add. No study, no work that is done here. Is not how we can rebuild Antakya, but it, they're trying to calculate how they can get more revenue out of this place. We also do know quite well that some of the cultural stones were sold in Adana as well. The same happens with the Diyarbakır. As well, Gaziantep some of the cultural stones were sold in Gaziantep. So, they're not thinking about how to bring back Antakya. We were very tired. We were really hit. So how to cope with this group which are seeking more profits? The last few remaining homes they, that they could not call, uh, take down. And I believe that with your work they Hepinize were able to, they were preserved çok, standing. Çok so thank Sağ you very olun. much to all of you. Thank you for all your work.
Thank you, Ken Anbe, and your work too. Uh, that was very much part of it. Uh, Gulis Hoja, uh, would you like to respond? I would like to thank Ken Anbe once again because he was affected, he was hit by the earthquake so much, but in order to preserve his space, he always put in his effort. He helps everyone that was asking for it, including ourselves. We are all upset and they're more upset than us. They are moved more. I don't know what to say because it is very difficult to see it slipping through our hands, but we will still continue thinking what we can do without losing our hope. We'll try to do things. And this will be thanks to your support, uh, but thank you especially a lot. If we could do anything, I mean, we come from the outside, we could not achieve much without you. So with you, we try to do our best to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I would like to give the microphone to Siakan Koch. Uh, who raised his hand. Good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Hakan Koç. I am an urban planner from Urban Planning Chamber in Hatay. First of all, for your work, I would like to thank you on behalf of my city. It looks like a fantastic one uh, in terms of a roadmap and in terms of documentation. But just like Professor Gulis said, you prepared one thing, but at the same time, other things happened in the meantime. So some of your predictions uh, in terms of further design, some of your considerations were not considered. Uh, so, for example, uh, the structures, the buildings that are supposed to be, that were supposed to be protected, are no longer with us. So, I took several notes, actually. Um, so, you emphasized one thing, but just uh, to emphasize a little bit more, urban scale planning, and that should be a uh, priority consideration, in my opinion, because we just focus on a single zone, just the historical site, and all the evaluations are done over there. Yes, our historical site is very important, very valuable, yes. And uh, the Turkish uh, design uh, foundation says that actually it's even more important than uh, Toledo, but we have no longer the life that we used to have. We're talking about nearly 150,000 uh, people live in a very, very small confined space. And we're talking about extremely low quality buildings. One of them caught fire today, one of the buildings, and they had children at home and we saved them in the last minute. And uh, about like six pieces were burnt down uh, very, very quickly. And materials based on petroleum are used uh, in these buildings and technical assessments and monitoring is not also done and there's a humanitarian aspect to it and we keep saying how long will it take to rehabilitate rebuild a city we're talking about a decade we're looking at a decade during this time where will all these people live so i wanted to just note that I have several notes uh, about the causes of damage. This is my opinion, actually. Well, the uh, power of the earthquake is also very, very important. Maybe you could have added that. Uh, we have geology, uh, geological engineers as well, because when we think of the magnitude of the earthquake, it was several uh, times uh, bigger than what were listed in the regulations. Um, as an herbal planner, I uh, had a chance to work on uh, ground studies. I'm not sure if it's done properly, but ground studies are done. I know that that's done during uh, before the planning was approved. And uh, the professor also mentioned that we have a very weak ground. We're not only just talking about the historical site. Up until the main uh, arteries 
starting from the western side, we don't have settlement. The entire ground uh, structure is actually uh, the same. We're not talking about good um, quality of ground. We don't have any, any ground that is actually suitable for dwelling in Antakya Defne. So building traces were also mentioned. In Antakya, as you know, the ownership actually goes back to the French mandate. And there were already certain favoritization uh, activities. And Professor Ken would know it really, really well. Uh, we would take into account the streets uh, when we came up with plans. Maybe we were not we were not going to be able to reconstruct the streets where they used to be because there are also shifts post earthquake when we don't have any point of reference anymore. So I have serious concerns. We are not going to have the same network of streets. Maybe we'll, we'll see them shifted if we are to rebuild the city from scratch. And one other thing. I had the chance to read through the planning notes. There are radical uh, decisions as well, like, for example, uh, the greening of, of Asi River and University uh, area. There is also uh, planned. And about population density, there was a very high figure, and I have no idea what that figure is based on. And special project areas were also come up with urban transformation and urban design areas and local governments apparently are going to be involved in the implementation here's what i project if local governments and local public are to be involved in shouldering this job we will have no chance to see this city rebuilt because economically speaking, the local governments and the local society have lost hugely in terms of economic resources. And a plan that is to be approved these days, maybe some of it will be done by uh, the ministry, but the rest, I think, will just remain as planned. So I think the plan should be implementable, applicable, and financial models should be also offered to ensure economic resources. So. You actually talked about the first stage. You designated 12 areas, but you did not have an area of focus outside of the urban protected area, but most of the population is actually outside of that protected area. And I always point one thing out. Hatay has two centrums. Iskanderun is one center, and Antakya uh, is another center. So we have two commercial centers. So you have Rehanlı, Samanda, Altunözü, Kırıkan, partly. So all the neighboring districts come to Antakya uh, to do their commercial activities. Or in Uzunçarşı, all the shops are there and all the shopping is done there. Can you slowly wrap up so we, other people can also give a contribution? Okay, okay. Uh, yani şu an hala orada bir var. There is Bunlar... still some sort of vibrancy there, and we should also focus there. <inaudible> Lastly, a question to the civil engineer. So we have decision 660 to guide restorations and re rehabilitations of buildings. How correct would it be to rebuild um, these structures based on their former techniques? Do you think we should see an amendment in the regularity? Thank you. Um, can you answer in one or two sentences? Uh, yes, uh, sure. Um, well, the civil decision pre-earthquake um, we had a similar concern because you cannot have 
100% of resistance to buildings to an earthquake. So you should do retrofitting, you should do restor restoration as authentically as possible, adapting to your uh, charters and with minimum intervention. However, the earthquake showed us one thing. When you have cultural properties, you cannot protect it, protect them in such a fashion and the people either. You cannot protect the people either. When you think of cultural properties and homes that people live in should be separate, separated, although they're registered as well. But when you think of mosques, they should be considered separately. I think post earthquake, a lot of our ideas have changed because to protect these places, we need to do different things. For example, last week I was in Antakya. The former assembly building is a place that we're working on. So they want to reconstruct in a way that looked the same, but they wanted to also make use of the know-how of the 20th century and thereby think of it this way why don't we have an experience like those in japan where people just shake go out and go back as you know the fault line was broken in the north but the large fault line through the red sea is not broken yet for the next earthquake we should build uh homes buildings that are not going to collapse okay can i add something very briefly <laughs> yes just one thing this is very challenging what you're saying just to disable some misunderstanding we're we're not talking about uh like completely different techniques so understand well figure out the weaknesses of uh the used method and try to rebuild base uh as close to the original as possible that needs science okay can i uh respond to what sarkhan said yes briefly? go ahead Matt. Thank you, Sarkan, için. for your contribution. From day one, you have been on the site and you worked immensely. So thank you so much for that. And we wanted to express certain things quite fast, so maybe we have overlook certain areas. So let me put it this way. So we've had, there is the focus. There is uh, the area in front of the firefighters building up until the village uh, borders and that area is still actively I think of also the population on the periphery uh, there's still the, the area where people come in do their shopping it's still vibrant so it is a part of our areas of focus so i would just want to mention that thank you Thank you. There have been some people uh, with their hand up for a long time, and I would really like to invite them also to give a very brief uh, comment or to ask a question. And the first one uh, would be Ibrahim Gutschman. Please go ahead. Good evening. Thank you for your presentation. Very valuable work you have done. I'm aware of your efforts as well. So thank you. We're going to benefit from this work we discussed with Professor Gulis. Where is that benefit going to be? There is a presidential decree uh, about a certain transformation and we went to court we also shared 
the news of, of uh, the litigation with the public. So we wanted the public to be involved. We've pursued the developments in court, but we did not receive the results that we wanted. There are several reasons, uh, including legal and political. Actually, there were certain uh, issues with the risky area designation. The court uh, did not give us a stay of execution, but actually we're concerned that there could be a political motivation. So we're talking about two months between the earthquake and the court decision, it was very, very quick because we're talking about so many things that needed to be done within that period of time. And that was very, very important to note because we were not focusing on the urgent matters and the non-urgent matters were very, very swiftly taken care of. And that was the political administration doing this. And that was very, very exhausting. We had pain, we were still grieving after all of these human losses, psychologically speaking, healthcare wise, we were not doing well, but there were new pieces of legislation, new executive orders that were serialized almost. It was very, very difficult to enlighten people in such a case. And that was further uh, saddening than, than the earthquake. Both municipalities and uh, other municipalities across the country had similar work before that. However, the post-earthquake period could not be managed well. Accommodation, healthcare issues, family reunions were urgent matters, and the state could not fix any of these issues, and they've urgently focused on protected areas or retransformation. Politicians were very remote from the city. Mayors were also very disconnected. We had a huge sense of solitude. But at the same time, we've had unprecedented activities in the country. Professional organizations and NGOs came together. They came up with fantastic jobs, but they had limited resources. They did not have the power to invest, but they wanted to guide the way for local governments, the Hatay Bar Association, the chambers of engineers and architects, and uh, environment and urbanization. Union also had a lot of contributions. Professors coming from other cities also contributed a lot. However, we could not turn their efforts into action. We expressed ourselves to the state officials. They saw what we said, but they could not help us turn things into action. Nine months have passed. Certain plans are still not put into action. Just accommodation problem is trying to be fixed. Although NGOs had very high level work in the area, we we're talking about great levels of effort. If we could swiftly take action, that could be a huge um, benefit, but that's not the case. We're working with the Minister of Culture, with courts, with Minister of uh, Environment. We are trying to also live on. We are talking about massive uh, needs for accommodation. We have friends helping in from other places, from other cities and professors. So one thing that really raises our hopes today is uh, NGOs and professional organizations coming together to produce solutions. We will try to carry on their efforts. We know that our criticisms are considered behind closed doors. We receive, we hear their feedback. I can directly talk with 
ministry officials, so they listen to us. At least it helps us uh, make our voice heard. But in terms of impl implementation, there are massive gaps to be filled. Can we uh, support local governments? Yes. Yes. And everyone is ready. Everyone is ready to get to work. But the state is not turning plans into action. So all the lack of organization at the beginning of this whole post-earthquake period still carries on. So we need to first overcome this. Ibrahim Bey, can you wrap up? So central government and local, co local governments should work hand in hand for common projects and they should involve local actors as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibrahim Bey. Uh, we go on right away to the next person with the hand up, Murat Tenegejiolo. Go ahead, please. Teşekkür ediyorum. Herkese iyi akşamlar diliyorum. Thank you very much and good evening to everyone. Uh, all professors mentioned everything quite well, so I don't have too much to say. They did great analysis. And from time to time we talk and share. But I would like to express OTTÜ, Middle East Technical University and Touchdown, after the earthquake, they are with Antakya and they're giving us uh, support. And this support that they give, I personally did not receive from my own government. I wish I could have. So in this issue, it was a disappointment for me. I would like to emphasize one thing. In the huge city, historical structures, cultural assets, all areas, they turned into plot of land that is suitable for construction. This is the most striking point that I see because it happened in such a way that even the physical limits, the borders of structures are lost as mentioned by Professor Sinan, but I wanted to emphasize it once more. The sites, uh, preserved areas, they open them to urban transformation. Maybe this is, uh, this was the problem and this was giving news for what was to come. What could the solution be? Could there be a solution? So to a great extent, it's about the central, it's about the attitude of the central government and what they will, because they are the ones who govern. They are the authority. They represent the authority. So since the first day, as a civil society organization, we said the following. We said the central government should lead local administrations, universities, NGOs, universities, chambers, in a sincere way, hand in hand, together, they should start coming up with solutions because there are so many universities in Turkey that are not used. Everything is left up to the private industry. I'm not against private industry, but everything is left to private industry and to the processes run by them, or how can I say, or processes, a foundation that is led by private industry, a foundation called Turkish Design Foundation. So even though this much destruction has happened already, they do say we're going to prepare a preservation plan, but there's nothing left to preserve. So that's the contradiction that I observe. So just like the archaeological or ground vulnerabilities, which were at the forefront, so when we think about a solution, we only, as a civil society organization, we just try and give some short messages by using social media 
or by talking to the ministry, by talking to the professors or local administrations, I mean, by talking to all stakeholders, we try to do something. We try to bring it to a result, to a positive result, to find the shared benefit. So far, Murat Bey, can you also the biggest up? problem that I observe, the biggest problem that I observe is the that the central government was not willing to create that common ground. Thank you so so much. Good evening. Thank you, Murat Bey. Everyone is making very important uh, contributions, and there's a lot more uh, to discuss, but uh, I think we also slowly have to uh, come to an end. So I see four more people with their hand up, and I would like to invite them all to very briefly speak, and then maybe afterwards we can have a reaction from Gulis Hoja or some of the other contributors. Um, but I would like everyone to really... Um, focus on their main points they would like to uh, bring up um, next uh, with a hand up is uh, Ejivit Alkan. Good evening to everyone. I would like to very quickly talk about a few points. First thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is the cooperation with the local states the state and civil society organizations have a typical perspective we with that perspective we see that they want to cooperate with the local but i can say that everybody is failing in that regard what i, I what they mean by cooperation with the local is not if it's just talking or sharing problems or concerns it's very easy to do so but if it is about knowing their needs and coming up with solutions for uh, their needs, I think that is not a problem that we can overcome with typical methods. For instance, EU or UN fund projects show us this, especially I joined in a recent project. In order to receive support as the local, we must prepare a project and it has to be perfect, they make such demands, but this is an earthquake area, and in an earthquake area, disaster area, it's not possible. So it turns into civil society organizations doing what they can do uh, or as they wish, just like the state is doing. Also, I have a question to uh, Professor Hatice Pamir. The recently declared reserve structure area law and the risky area law. When the two laws are overlaid, they look it looks like they complete each other. They look symmetrical. Especially when it comes to the Akdeniz neighborhood, I wonder what Professor Pamir is thinking because the Urmumcu Square during the excavation, a Turkish bath rune was found there. I'm not 100% sure. Is that why the Akdeniz neighborhood was declared a reserve area, even though most structures there were still standing? Thank you very much and good evening. Georgia, would you like a very quick evet. response? Evet. Uh, şimdi ben, uh, Hoca yes, sure. As Professor Gülis was talking, we discussed that urban area, preservation area, is the entirety of the city, not just some areas. For instance, at the Uğur Mumcu excavation, they did not just find a bath, but also a settlement and a church, some church remains. And part of that re area was declared first degree. A preservation area and the remaining was third degree so that people don't lose their ownership rights and during reconstruction decisions can be made accordingly. So the planning, the new planning, the reserve area, I only saw it in the correspondence. I did not have the chance to see it personally. I'm abroad right now. 
when it comes to declaring it a reserve area, I don't know what kind of a decision they made, but what I know is that the city, the city of Antakya, in late Roman era, was shifting towards the west of Asi River. We see this in 1930s uh, excavations as well. I don't know if this answers your question, but of course, the city continues at the western side of Asi, Asi River as well. There are archaeological areas. Okay, I want to say this very quickly. Never we should think there's an archaeological deposit here. There are archaeological ruins under the ground, so no structure can be built. Not with that concern, but every place has its own attributes. Planning and production can be done accordingly. Many other examples are seen in similar cities like Athens or Rome. We see this in different places. It can be done. So I don't think the reserve area declaration or designation is about the archaeological area. Thank you. Thank you for the question and for the response. Next, there's Shada Nizamolo. Shada, we go ahead. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. First of all, I would like to thank the entire team for this long running study that required a lot of patience. I have a question. One of them, as mentioned before, it's not about the presentation directly. When it comes to archaeological areas, there is a decision for first degree ones. Every digging under uh, the red coat requires archaeological in area exploration, we see that when it comes to archaeological areas, there is a decision for first degree ones. Every digging under uh, the red coat requires archaeological in area exploration. We see that uh, during the removal of the debris within the archaeological area, archaeological site, cultural layers have been damaged. And this is actually crime against cultural assets. Is there any reporting of a crime? This is the same for other cultural assets. For instance, there are destruction decisions made for other cultural assets. Are Is the necessary permits taken from the council? That is my first question because I'm curious. And secondly, outside the project, just to receive information, I'm curious, what awaits us, for instance, in your report, in drawing one, there are cultural asset buildings which need preservation, traditional structures, let's say, in an urban site, registered cultural assets are he is really breaking up on my side. I think we've lost. Uh... Sedar Bey, uh, can you hear us? I think he may wow. come back. Sorry, I broke. Uh, can you hear me now? So, what awaits us? 
Professor Nehriman talked about it briefly, talked about the significance of conventional structures. If we, can, if we could preserve the two together, conventional structures and cultural assets, if we could preserve the fabric, we, we would be able to continue seeing it because 50% of the building stock would be these ones and 50 the other ones. So now the registered cultural assets almost, even though they are registered, more less than 50% we had the release uh, for them. We had the uh, sur survey for f less than 50%. So we only had photos. So their reconstruction would not be realistic. Uh, in my opinion, it would not be realistic in the uh, fabric, in the traditional fabric. There is not enough documentation, which means as the professor said, there is an inevitable theater decoration situation that awaits us. Is that the situation? That one was what that was my question. Thank you very much once again for all your efforts. Thank you. So there were two questions. Uh, maybe Hatice Oja can say something very briefly about the first question, uh, and Neriman Oja about the second question. The first question was broken, so I couldn't really hear. If you could remind me the question, so, I can answer correctly. As I, as I could follow, it was about like whether there were any um, criminal complaints filed because of the loss of uh, archaeological value. Uh, tamam, tamam. Şimdi, uh, okay, ben... yes, I remember. So right now, I'm the head of the excavation. I'm running it, the excavation. In my own area, when I detect something, I write a petition to the cultural assets uh, unit. Everyone can do this. The, you can present such petitions, such letters. You don't have to do it collectively to the Hatay unit. When you see them, you can present it a letter. There are certain conditions to work in a first degree site, but in Antakya, in the process, none of these were fulfilled. The first degree sites were ignored and on top of them, with a decision, containers, cities were set up on top of them. In, for instance, Kuchuk, Dalian, the container city. So, until June, if I'm not wrong, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Until July, it was extended and the first degree sites, every kind of intervention without a permit were allowed. For instance, in my own excavation area, the the governor used it as a burial, as a cemetery. And of course, I wrote an objection about this officially. So such things happened a lot. So in the future, everyone has the right to write this petition and make it a complaint. Thank you. I will briefly say the concerns are justified. Yes, but when there's a war, or earthquake or disasters, this is um, inevitable. There are other examples in the world as well. Reconstruction, I'm against it in principle, but when it comes to this specific place, how the right reconstruction can be done, I'm writing a technical guideline for it. I have never defended this in my life, never advocated it, because here we, the way to collectively rehabilitate is to recreate that environment. You are right, probably maybe half of the registered structures, we have surveys for them and uh, we can do it uh, as true to the original as possible. The other ones, uh, for instance, there are street projects. There's a lot of information belonging to the locals as well. If we could use them correctly and if we could create a good quality environment. Maybe it will not be what it was, but still 
maybe we can get the chance to recreate the structural fabric that we have in our memory. It will not be as good as we want, but how good can it be? I think we have to push for it because this was a layer itself. It was a strata. Just imagining that the lower ones are more valuable, like Roma, Roman or Hellenistic. These are equally valuable. They belong to the Ottoman, uh, but we lost it. So even for the registered ones, there is an untouched region as well. Maybe in the last trip, uh, the professors can take a look at that as well. But even if there is this fakeness, we must create re recreate what we have in our memory, because if this is important for society, then we have to do it. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give a short answer as well. Can you keep it very short, Ibrahim Bey? Because there's other people also. Yes. Sure. There is no complaint from the citizens against the state. We don't have such a study. We don't have enough data yet. We must work more in the field. But I know an incident. Ministry of Culture made complaints, criminal complaints, 14, because in the area, citizens demolished or made changes without a permit. The, the, there are findings. In order to preserve it, the Ministry of Culture complained against those citizens. So we can also not only this complain against the state, but also the citizens. They should work to preserve or some try to use it as an opportunity to make gains. We have such observations or findings. So we can draw attention to the mistake of our citizens as well to create societal awareness. We must warn people. And we know the findings of the professors. They put, for instance, an iron bar on old structures and make them unhealthy. We should know these i wanted to remind it but if there is to be a criminal complaint there's a lot to be done for everything that was ignored so far we must make complaints the criminal complaints but we need concrete data when we are to make a complaint we must be able to back it with the evidence but right now there is no such demand from citizens and no such study thank you thank you Ibrahim. Uh, Next, we have Canan. Canan, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm working as an academic in Hatay Mustafa Kemal University. I observed this project from day one with interest, and very painstaking work has been put into this project, and I would like to thank for the efforts of all the contributors. As you know, I guess Selan also mentioned it. In the post-earthquake period, where projects are still being carried out, there has been a massive transparency issue. So access to projects, getting information about the projects were not really possible. And I, I'm talking as a person that lived there for about a decade before this program began tonight. Urban Planners Chamber released a statement tonight, and actually in that statement were certain issues that had been worrying me for a long time. So the most important thing that they lay out is the following. When you think of the demolition process, very fragmented and project-oriented approaches had have been adopted. Um, actually, that's as an approach causes the following. It's basically fragmenting Hatay uh, and giving them over to massive architectural companies. I don't think that those massive architectural companies can rehabilitate in, the, in a proper way the city of Hatay. And this approach has brought about a series of other wrong decisions, and there has been 
unending series of problems coming directly from the central government, Murat and Ibrahim mentioned a lot of them. Lastly, here is what I would like to know. There are so many academics here with us from different disciplines. In the long term, we always talk about higher participation, more inclusivity, and longer term plans to rehabilitate the city. So we have all these academics here. Are, what kind of inclusive plan do we foresee for the long term? Here is a question that I have for from uh, academics. I would like to hear them. I guess that would be very meaningful to have one sentence from everyone. How can we come up with an inclusive Hatay going forward? Or, in your view, uh, is this fragmented project-based approach something that you approve of? I would like to just know your answers. Yeah, I think... Uh, let's do it uh, last. Let's do that at the end. And first, uh, ask uh, Egi Yildirim to ask her question or give her comments. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Very fast. I'd like to express myself just like everyone else. I would like to express my thanks to the team and congratulations for such great work. Despite everything, when we look at the local government, local neighborhoods, it's really impressive to see hope uh, being reborn. Legal struggles still carry on and it's actually making us feel quite good because we have uh, lawyers. I guess Ibrahim Göçman is a, is a lawyer. We have other lawyers among us. And I guess it's a very, very important aspect of this whole development. So we have upcoming local elections and what are local governments doing? What are their approaches? What are the uh, conversations that you're having with their representatives? Because there is all this pressure coming in from central government and all the negative developments due to that. But actually, there is a power balance between local governments and the central government. And what does that look like? And although this looks like it's outside of our technical scope of discussion here, we're obviously talking about something that's very uh, sociological and political, but we have a massive accumulation of know-how. And there is a huge contradiction in implementation. We are still very, very surprised. It's not just a natural disaster, it's a governance disaster and a cultural disaster as well. And the best thing to do would be to document, document, and document for the sake of memory and to make sure that's accessible to the public. And Professor Gulis talks about that, uh, how their work is being done in as much transparency as possible with access to the public and there we can work proactively to make sure that it's accessible to the public and also to make a note for history. So, I guess, to answer your question, Jana, to leave it to the public, to leave it to the flow of history. I guess that's uh, what we're heading to. It may sound a little bit philosophical, but I guess this is uh, the most realistic thing to expect. Thank you. So, uh, Janan and Ege, they have raised uh, points that really uh, require uh, new meetings and further thoughts and further project. I don't think we can address all these issues uh, in uh, this evening's meeting, and it's getting also quite late. Uh, Guliz Hoja should uh, uh, have an opportunity to uh, respond to many of the things that have been said. Özgün, also from the uh, Touchdown team, also wants to say something. Uh, Özgün first, Guliz Hoja first, I don't know. No. Maybe I, Gülis could connect with what I've said. We have discussed policies a lot as well. So when we did this work, uh, we did also work on conceptual uh, dimensions. So how to cope with the effect of a, of a disaster. And we looked at examples from the other parts of the world. So disaster 
it takes place in a political ground, you cannot prevent it from happening, but determining on how rehabilitation is done is about policy, is about politics. And politicians and their decisions shape your appropriation level. It's all post earthquake efforts. All of those can change. And when we think of Turkey and politicians accumulate uh, allocation of resources, as well as the measures taking for disasters, uh, tell us a very, very sad story. Maybe uh, Professor Gulis can carry on from where I'm leaving off here. Thank you. Words probably as a lawyer, Nadasin. About three weeks ago, uh, just to answer Jana's question, about three weeks ago, there were project works by the Design Foundation. I joined their meeting and there they discussed where the former assembly was built. There was a project uh, with the shape of a crescent. So the entire area could turn into a series of islands and it really looked like a very nice project. The planning looked very nice, but after the planning was presented, we asked a question. We asked about their legal framework. So you're going to take people's lots. Where are you going to put people's properties? What about the legal framework? What are you going to, what have you uh, shared with the public? A noise came out from architects. They were like, why are you even like, pointing out that? We're just talking about plans. Nobody wanted to really discuss the ownership and the owner's aspect. Actually, they were planning about 200 meter deep green zones, but construction approached the river up to even 60 meters. So there is no societal background. There is no legal uh, background to these plans. There should be a consensus with the public, but there is no such thing any, uh, at the moment. If you want something uh, in a more holistic way, maybe we can hear from Gülis Beginaltinas. Just a few words to conclude. Just like Foka said, all of these actually are reasons for a completely new meeting, and we would like to discuss them. Obviously, we don't have a straightforward answer to this question, and we're talking about multidimensional issues here. So we're talking about political space, and everything is set with politics at this process. And at the upper level, just like Murat said, you have central government, local governments, and all stakeholders, and they should work in tandem with each other in a chaotic environment like this, it's impossible to work like that. Just like you've said, there's a fragmented and project-based approach. I believe that I don't support that, nor my team supports it. But here's what we've said from the beginning. At the end of the day, we set forth for this uh, issue and we wanted to do something for Antakya. We said we are experts. We are experts of site protection and planning. We are trying to um, set our boundaries within our discipline, but we need further disciplines to get involved. But immediately in the post-earthquake period, I was invited to uh, an international meeting, and it was about collaboration, post-earthquake collaboration. And here's what I could do, because we didn't have uh, do with during the meeting. I asked, I answered the question, how can we turn from chaos into collaboration? Everyone tries to do something. They're all well-intentioned uh, efforts, and what, ours is one of it. We don't have the power to do everything, and we don't have the authority either. We can just pave the way for 
the implementers and to uh, make a link between the several stakeholders. So a spatial uh, and a scientific groundwork that we can offer. All our data is accessible and we share our scientific data and results to whoever uh, with whoever wants it, but all these different pieces should be brought together within a systematic framework. And for example, we submitted everything that we've done to the ministry before, and we're going to submit all of our upcoming reports. They might or might not use them, Does it doesn't matter. We want it to be transparent, scientific, participatory. We want experts to join in with their efforts. So we are trying our best to look at things from a multi multiple uh, dimension perspective. But of course, it has further dimensions than what we have also already mentioned. But before that, let me put it this way. When we look at examples from other parts of the world, we say the following. They say what destroys is not the earthquake, but the post-earthquake management of the process. That destroys more. Socially, psychologically, physically uh, speaking, that destroys more. Could we have managed that better? Yes. That's why we say from hope for recovery to concerns over loss. That's the title of our program today. So now we are at the stage of a second uh election period so as long as we have frequent elections in turkey we're going to carry on with our efforts but i'm not sure if we're going to be successful because at the end of the day all these people who want to do something should share their efforts not expecting everything from everyone but we should bring together our forces and and Maybe it's not going to be an answer to your question, but we need to discuss all together. That's a long answer maybe for you. Thank you, uh, Gulis Hoja. Uh, I think at this point we should uh, uh, finish this meeting and uh, start thinking about follow-up meetings and new topics. Uh, but uh, uh, for now, maybe it's good to uh, to come to an end. The topic of today's meeting has not been uh, the most uh, happy. We've heard about many difficulties uh, and uh, at the same time, we've heard about very um, impressive work being done by many people uh, in a, a very impressive way. And as a final word, actually what I would like to do is to read one of the messages that was put in the chat uh, by Frederick Thompson, who is uh, from uh, Cultural Emergency Response. And I think he has left the meeting, uh, so he is not able to read it himself, but I would like to read it out as a final remark. He writes, thank you all very much, dear members of Metu Touchdown, for this incredible effort and for your insights. On behalf of SHARE, we are deeply grateful for your partnership. Have a good evening. I think that sums up very well what uh, many people feel about um, the very impressive work being done uh, by the project. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to all the people that have uh, contributed to the discussions. Uh, and also a special thank you to the interpreters who've done an incredible job uh, interpreting all the um, uh, contributions uh, and uh, apologies to all the people that I've uh, cut short uh, and uh, apologies to people that had trouble coming in. Uh, I hope you all felt that this was a successful meeting. I thought it was really very valuable and uh, I wish you all a good evening uh, and hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye everyone.